Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the future. My name is Ling. And my name is Lucky. And uh, thank you all for coming here today. Ohio Wesleyan has a very proud tradition of creativity, innovation, and service. It is in that spirit that we present our very first TEDx event at Ohio Wesleyan University. And first, we'd like to send out a couple of special thanks to everyone who made this possible. In particular, of course, we'd like to thank Ted, who makes all of this possible. We'd also like to thank uh, Dean of Students Kimberly Goldsberry, Vice President Craig Olam, uh, Professor Eric Nesda, who has helped us prepare our student speakers and give us a lot of tips on uh, what we need to do. I'd also like to thank uh, Chuck Delalana, Cole Hatcher, Elaine Chun, um, uh, Mona Spalsbury and Don Wright in the uh, Student Involvement Office, as well as the Wesleyan Council of Student Affairs, WCSA, whose funding made this event possible, as well as Horizons International, who is, who is graciously providing uh, refreshments and snacks uh, being sold in the lobby. And we'd also like to thank the music department for letting us use this amazing venue. And we'd also like to request that uh, we not bring uh, food or drinks into the auditorium. And if you do, please dispose of trash in specified containers. And we'd also like to mention that we please ask you to silence your cell phones so as not to make excessive noise or disturbances during the speech speeches. Thank you. And also, if you need to use the restroom, please wait for the time between talks to avoid disruption. Uh, as part of our license agreement with TED, we will be showing two extraordinary talks from the TED website. We shall begin today with a talk entitled, It's Not Fair Having 12 Pairs of Legs, presented by Amy Mullins at the 2009 TED conference. Are we ready? That's right. Let's get started. I was speaking to a group of about 300 kids, ages six to eight, at a children's museum. And I brought with me a bag full of legs, similar to the kinds of things you see up here, and had them laid out on a table um, for the kids. And from my experience, you know, kids are naturally curious about what they don't know or don't understand or is foreign to them. They only learn to be frightened of those differences when an adult influences them to behave that way and maybe censors that natural curiosity or you know, reigns in the question asking for the, in the hopes of them being polite little kids. So, I mean, I, could, I just pictured a first grade teacher out in the lobby with these unruly kids saying, now, whatever you do, don't stare at her legs. When, of course, that's the point. That's why I was there. I wanted to invite them to look and explore. So I made a deal with the adults that the kids could come in without any adults for two minutes on their own. So the doors open. The kids descend on this table of legs, and they are poking and prodding, and they're wiggling toes, and they're trying to put their full weight on the sprinting leg to see what happens with that. And I said, kids, really quickly, I woke up this morning, I decided I wanted to be able to jump over a house. Nothing too big, two or three stories, but if you could think of any animal, any superhero, any cartoon character, anything you can dream up right now, what kind of legs would you build me? And immediately, a voice shouted, Kangaroo, no, 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 it should be a frog. No, it should be Go Go Gadget. No, 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 it should be uh, The Incredibles and other things that I don't, aren't familiar with. And then one eight-year-old said, hey, uh, why wouldn't you want to fly, too? And the whole room, including me, was like, yeah. <laughs> and just like that, I went from being a woman that these kids would have been trained to see as disabled to somebody who had potential that their bodies didn't have yet, somebody that might even be super abled. Interesting. So some of you actually saw me at TED 11 years ago. And um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how life-changing this conference is for both speakers and attendees, and I am no exception. TED literally was the launch pad 
uh, to the next decade of my life's exploration. At the time, <clears throat> the legs I presented were groundbreaking in prosthetics. I had woven carbon fiber sprinting legs modeled after the hind leg of a cheetah, which you may have seen on stage yesterday. And um, also these very lifelike, intrinsically painted silicone legs. So at the time, it was my opportunity to put a call out to innovators outside the traditional medical prosthetic community to come bring their talent to the science and to the art of building legs so that we can stop compartmentalizing form, function, and aesthetic and assigning them different values. Well, lucky for me, a lot of people answered that call. Um, and the journey started, funny enough, with a TED conference attendee. Chi Perlman, who hopefully is in the audience somewhere today. She was the editor then of a magazine called ID, and she gave me a cover story. This started an incredible journey. Curious encounters were happening to me at the time. I'd been accepting numerous invitations to speak on the design of the cheetah legs around the world, and people would come up to me after the conference, after my talk, men and women, and the conversation would go something like this. You know, Amy, you're very attractive. You don't look disabled. <laughs> I thought, well, that's amazing, because I don't feel disabled. <laughs> and, you know, it really opened my eyes to this conversation that could be explored about beauty. What does a beautiful woman have to look like? What is a sexy body? And interestingly, from an identity standpoint, what does it mean to have a disability? I mean, people, Pamela Anderson has more prosthetic in her body than I do. Nobody calls her disabled. So, so this magazine, through the hands of graphic designer Peter Stavel, went to fashion designer Alexander McQueen and photographer Nick Knight, who were also interested in exploring that conversation. So three months after TED, I found myself on a plane to London doing my first fashion shoot, which resulted in this cover, Fashion Able. Three months after that, I did my first runway show for Alexander McQueen on a pair of hand-carved wooden legs made from solid ash. Nobody knew. Everyone thought they were wooden boots. Actually, I have them on stage with me. Grapevines, magnolias, truly stunning. Poetry matters. Poetry is what elevates the banal and neglected object to a realm of art. It can transform the thing that might have made people fearful into something that invites them to look and look a little longer and maybe even understand. I learned this firsthand with my next adventure, the artist Matthew Barney in his film opus called The Cream Master Cycle. This is where it really hit home for me, that my legs could be wearable sculpture. And even at this point, I started to move away from the need to replicate humanness as the only aesthetic ideal. So we made what people lovingly refer to as glass legs, even though they're actually optically clear polyurethane, aka bowling ball material. Heavy. Then we made these legs that are cast in soil with a um, potato root system growing in them and beet roots out the top and a very lovely brass toe. It's a good close-up of that one. Then another character was a half-woman, half-cheetah, a little homage to my life as an athlete, 14 hours of prosthetic makeup to get into a creature that had articulated paws, claws, and a tail that whipped around like a gecko. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another pair of legs we collaborated on were these. Look like jellyfish legs, also polyurethane. And the only purpose that these legs can serve outside the context of the film is to provoke the senses and ignite the imagination. So whimsy matters. Today, I have over a dozen pair of prosthetic legs that various people have made for me. And with them, I have different negotiations of the terrain under my feet, and I can change my height. I have a variable of five different heights. Um, <laughs> today, I'm 6'1". And I had these legs made a little over a year ago at Dorset Orthopedic in England, and when I brought them home to Manhattan, my first night out in the town, I went to a very fancy party, and a girl was there who has known me for years at my normal 5'8". Her mouth dropped open. 
when she saw me, and she went, but you're so tall. And I said, I know, isn't it fun? I mean, I know it's a little bit like wearing stilts on stilts, but I have an entirely new relationship to door jams that I never expected I would ever have. And I was having fun with it. And she looked at me and she said, but Amy, that's not fair. <laughs> and the incredible thing was she really meant it. It's not fair that you can change your height as you want it. And that's when I knew. That's when I knew that the conversation with society has changed profoundly in this last decade. It is no longer a conversation about overcoming deficiency. It's a conversation about augmentation. It's a conversation about potential. A prosthetic limb doesn't represent the need to replace loss anymore. It can stand as a symbol that the wearer has the power to create whatever it is that they want to create in that space. So people that society once considered to be disabled can now become the architects of their own identities and indeed continue to change those identities by designing their bodies from a place of empowerment. And what is exciting to me so much right now is that by combining cutting-edge technology, robotics, bionics, with the age-old poetry, we are moving closer to understanding our collective humanity. I think that if we want to discover the full potential in our humanity, we need to celebrate those heartbreaking strengths and those glorious disabilities that we all have. I think of Shakespeare's Shylock. If you prick us, do we not bleed? And if you tickle us, do we not laugh? It is our humanity and all the potential within it that makes us beautiful. Thank you. Next up, I have the opportunity to introduce a fellow student and a personal friend of mine. He is a senior physics major and a math minor. Um, he's had extensive travel experiences. Most notably, um, he spent the last two summers in remote regions of Alaska. And he learned about the potential challenges that the evolving climate systems can pose to our generation and the next generation on. Um, Zeke Brechtel will be studying, he'll be actually pursuing a master's in University of Colorado Boulder. And he will present to you Seasteading, the future of hab future habitats for humanity. Thank you. We're going to see if the lavalier mic stays on. I'm going to hold on to this just in case. So my story begins with a man who's been very influential in my life. But he's a man that I've never met. It begins with a grandparent who died before I was born. This grandparent, Grandpa Buzz. Now, at the time this picture was taken, my father's family and Grandpa Buzz were living in Moab, Utah, back before it was an outdoor mecca, before Arches was a national park, and when it was just a bunch of miners and ranchers trying to scrape a living out of the desert. Now at the time, my grandpa and his family were doing pretty well at scraping this living, so they decided that they would build their first family home. And my father, being the oldest, helped my grandfather the most in this construction. So over a few years in the 1960s, my father and his father built a home but they also built the relationship between a father and a son. And this experience is something that my father has always wanted to share with me, pictured in the background, not looking at the camera. Now, my father's gotten a few years older since that picture was taken, and he's once again in the background. And in case you can't tell, I'm the angsty adolescent, not looking at the camera up in front. And 
In our research for how we would build this house, we came across an idea, an idea that's not revolutionary or novel, but in its applications can be fundamentally important for how human habitats will change in the future. And so this idea starts with pretty simple origins. It starts with these. Now, each year, thousands of metal shipping containers make their way across the oceans to the United States. But because we import more than we export, many of these containers pile up in metal mounds like these, staying empty and not being utilized. These containers stack on top of each other like building blocks, like the Legos we used to play with as children, where if you were a patient child, like I was, you would get your latest kit of Legos and pull out the instructions and follow step by step, brick by brick, how to build your little castle or your Millennium Falcon. But the best experiences that we had when we were playing with Legos didn't come from following the instructions. It was when we used our imaginations to design our own castles, to design our own spaceships out of this pile of different shaped bricks that we truly gained experience as children. And by applying this imagination and looking at these shipping containers, we can see how we could take these empty containers that aren't being used and make something useful out of them, like a home. Or we could take these containers and stack them one on top of the other and make them into an office building, like this one's shown. So what we're doing is we're taking structures that already exist but aren't being utilized and with a little creativity, we're modifying them and adapting them and evolving them to be used in functional structures and functional habitats and buildings. And this idea isn't novel in any way. It's basically recycling. It's being thrifty with a resource and a structure that we already have and making it into something useful. And this idea can be important for humans as we continue to expand and to move on into the next frontiers. And if you were to ask someone at the Seasteading Institute in San Francisco, California, where these next frontiers for humanity would be, they would tell you that they're going to take place in communities like this. To seastead is to homestead on the sea. It's to colonize the oceans. The oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface, but humans have barely made a scratch on this entire area. At the Seasteading Institute, the Seasteading Institute they believe that we can build structures on the oceans like these that will allow us to take advantage of the natural resources inherent in the oceans that we can work to solve world hunger and our dependence on fossil fuels by growing algae near to these seasteading structures that can then be processed into foods or processed into biofuels. They believe that these communities will be technological hotbeds where people will be pushing the frontiers of what's possible. They believe that these communities will be the perfect places to experiment with new forms of human governance, to experiment with how we organize in societies as humans. And if these communities are indeed going to be the next frontiers, we should try to consider how we can build these communities with the resources that we already have. Something like this, a cargo ship that's designed to survive on the ocean for decades. Unfortunately, what happens with most of these cargo ships when they're retired is they'll be stripped of all the valuable components and innards and left to rust out in ship graveyards like this one shown off the coast of Mauritania. These ships are left to decay in these spots and to pollute the oceans. 
But instead of allowing this to happen, we can take advantage of these structures. We can modify them and utilize them to be part of these future seasteading communities in the next 30 or 40 years. Consider a cruise ship. It's designed to support thousands of humans for up to a week on end. And with a little modification and with connecting them to larger structures out in the ocean, these could form the future living spaces of people on the seasteading communities. So instead of just allowing this to rust away, we can modify them and adapt them for our future habitats. And so if we're going to consider these oceans as being the next frontier, we must also consider the final frontier, space. The company Bigelow Aerospace is at the cutting edge of the design of future space habitats. And these habitats are powerful because of the structures that they're made of and how, how the walls are made. The walls are composed of a fabric that's stronger than Kevlar. And so this allows the individual modules to be compressed down into little cylinders that can then be launched into space and when they eventually reach orbit can then be pressurized and expanded so we can get much more volume per each individual capsule, per each individual rocket that we send up. So these individual modules can then be linked together to create the next generation of space stations, the next generation of space habitats. These modules can also be used to put bases on the moon or on Mars. And the fabrics, like I said, have a material in them stronger than Kevlar that allows them to withstand micrometeorite impacts and the other inherent dangers of living in space. Now, scientists have also recently discovered another material that is stronger than Kevlar, and it comes from this. This is nanocellulose, and it can be stretched out into individual filaments that can then be implanted into plastic sheets that will then be stronger than Kevlar. And so theoretically, with more testing, these sheets might be able to withstand the austere environment of space. They might be able to withstand the micrometeorite impacts and the radiation that will be inherent in this environment. And then these sheets could be used to create future space stations. And what's so beautiful about nanocellulose is that it can be created from leftover organic material. It's created from wood pulp. So we could take the wood pulp left over from a wood processing factory and process this pulp in turn to create nanocellulose fibers that can make up future space stations, future space habitats that we might establish in the next 60 to 70 years. So where do we stand right now? This is a picture of the Atlantic coast from the International Space Station. And if you look up here, this is Cleveland. This is Columbus. So right around here is Delaware, Ohio. Right around here is Sanborn Music Hall. Right around here is the Jemison Auditorium, where I'm standing right now. If we look to the past, we can see that humans have always sought to explore, to expand their civilizations. But as we now look at the present, we see that we need to make use of the limited resources that we have in an effective way. And we need to protect our environment and protect our planet if we'll continue to survive as a civilization. And so as we move into the future, this idea of expanding our civilizations while protecting the environments might not have to be so mutually exclusive if we can make use of the resources that we have to build the next generation of habitats on land, on sea, and in space. Thank you. So, looks like we have time for some Q and A. So I don't know if any of you guys are feeling courageous or enthusiastic. 
Anybody? Go for it. No, not yet. It's, uh, there's a whole foundation that's dedicated to it. One of the founders of PayPal is actually backing it. So they're in the stage of collecting a lot of funding for it. But it's got some very interesting implications. And hopefully, they'll be able to get some established in the next few years. One of the ways they're pitching it is as creating individual Hong Kongs out on the ocean. So it should be pretty cool in the future. Um, I don't. I think that you can purchase um, individual shipping containers pretty cheaply. But then there's a lot of um, modifying and readjusting them and all that sort of construction projects that goes on with them. But I think what's important is the idea of we have these resources and these structures that can be used to build a future building. Why not make use of them instead of having to cut down more trees to make more particle board, or having to dig up more metal to make more shipping containers, that sort of thing. Go for it. Um, oh, look at that. It works. <laughs> Um, what are the implications of these seasteads on the ocean ecosystems that they're going to be intruding in? So that's a great question. Um, with, the, with the sort of habitats that they're creating and the kind of people that are funding these sort of projects and these sorts of research, one of the top goals is going to be to make sure that they don't have a long-lasting negative impact on the oceans. So. Theoretically, if they could grow algae only on the surface, they wouldn't be having too much of an impact beneath that. And they hopefully wouldn't be dropping too much, too many pollutants into the waters. But it would all depend on which communities are being established and what they're doing in the future. So I'm just a 22-year-old senior at Ohio Wesleyan University who thinks it's a cool idea. Hi. Um, do you have any knowledge on, like you mentioned, the, that they might try different governments there? Mm. Do you know how that would work? Would there be countries that would be sponsoring these, or would they, be, would they become their own kind of little corporate countries almost? So it's um, a big movement for it is libertarianism. And there are actually some quote unquote seasteads that have been established in the past. I don't know, have you seen the movie Pirate Radio? Anybody familiar with that? So there was a, there was some old bombardment uh, stations out on the ocean near Britain. And this guy went out and kind of took over this little platform and set up a pirate radio on there. And he declared it Sealandia and declared himself the Prince of Sealand. And so he, I think it was technically his own entity, and he was able to broadcast a pirate radio from there without having to follow all of the British Broadcasting Company guidelines. But he also tried to market it as a um, capital fund slash data storage place that was completely safe from any government intrusion because he was his own autonomous entity. So theoretically, uh, if they're out established in international waters, they wouldn't have to follow the guidelines of any government in question. But whether or not that will actually be the case in the future is, uh, remains to be seen. One more. Yeah, they have. They've got um, these capsules, right? Yeah, Bigelow Aerospace actually has, um, I think they've got two that are in space right now. And if anybody has iPhones, you can download an app called Skyview. And in Skyview, you can look up different satellites. And you can uh, technically look in space and see where these capsules are at any given moment. And if you check out Bigelow Aerospace's website, they're also uh, offering to rent these out to different governments or different capitalist organizations, I guess, that for a very large chunk of money that probably not many people could handle. But it definitely, pro it definitely is the future of uh, space station habitat designs. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Sean McCulloch, 
graduated from State University of New York in 1995 with double majors in computer science and mathematics. He received his PhD in computer science from the University of Virginia in 2002. He joined the OU faculty in 2001 as since then has taught most of the courses offered in computer science major. Dr. McCulloch has also co-authored several papers, including statistical analysis of Texas Hold'em. This paper has since been, then been used for legal cases determining the legal status of a poker game of skill versus chance. The title of this presentation is Undecidability and What Future Computers Can't Do. Please welcome Dr. Sean McCulloch. All right. You guys can hear me? It's on? Okay. So I'm looking at the talks, and I think it's interesting that kind of the student talks are full of hope and excitement about the future, and the faculty talks are going to be not. <laughs> um, I'm giving this talk because when I, when I heard this event announced about the future and, and what's going to come and what's going to happen, as a computer science person, I watch a lot of movies and I see a lot of TV shows and I see a lot of people talking about what's going to come and what's going to happen and what all is going to be going on in the future. So you know about the robot butlers. You know about, we, we, you saw the stream before about the bionic hand that can do things. Um, you've been watching the news, you know about the Google glasses that you can put on your head and the Google will search for things for you. Which is all nice and it's all neat and it's all coming, but as you may have guessed, I am a cynical pessimist. And as a cynical pessimist, when I think about technology in the future, I think about this. Specifically, I think about this. <laughs> That is Microsoft telling you, hang on, I'm working. And if you've ever had this happen, you know that when Microsoft tells you this, it may be working for a minute, or it may be working for an hour, or it may be working forever. And I don't want you to think this is just a Microsoft problem. If you're a Mac person, there's the spinning beach ball of death. Um, and if it goes on for a while, you get a window like this that says Windows Explorer is not responding. And if you look at these options closely, which nobody really does, it's just, you know, oh no. Um, your th the three options they give you are check for a solution and restart the problem, which means look online and hope the starting over fixes things. There's close the program, which means I think this is going to run forever and oh well, kill it. <laughs> and my favorite is wait for the program to respond, which is boy, I really, really hope I don't have to kill my program and lose my 10 page paper. Maybe waiting five more minutes, magic will happen and this thing will stop. So wouldn't it be awesome if instead of this window, we got a window that popped up that said, yeah, this thing is going to stop. Have faith. Just wait a few more minutes. Don't crash your paper. Or alternately, yeah, you're screwed. This program's going to run forever. Time to kill things. Wouldn't it be nice if Windows would pop up and tell you that? Or said a little more generally, wouldn't it be nice if someone would write a program, those damn computer scientists, wouldn't it be nice if someone would write a program to tell you whether your machine was really hanging and was stuck or would eventually unfreeze. Well, I'm here to tell you that is what we call undecidable. Undecidable basically means can't write the program to solve this problem. Okay? Um, an undecidable problem means it's impossible for anyone, not just me because I'm stu not smart enough, not with, not, nobody, to write a program that will correctly say yes, you're going to stop all the times you're supposed to say yes and say no, you're supposed to stop all the times you're supposed to say no. Um, and when I say anyone, I really do mean anyone. It's not like we're waiting for future awesome, the Mozart of programming to come and be really, really good at fixing these problems. We're not just too stupid to solve it. We can show that it really, really can't be solved. We're not waiting for faster computers or bigger hard drives or more memory or anything like that. It really, really can't be solved. We're not waiting for new funky tools to help us write better programs or software or programming languages or whatever else really, really can't be solved. And if you think about it, that's a big deal, right? It's a big deal to say never. It's a big deal to say not now, not later, no matter how smart you are, no matter how fast computers get, because computers have gotten, you know, back in my day, 
I was in the, the Commodore 64 era, where you know, 64 kilobytes was an awesome amount of RAM. Um, <laughs> And I'm saying from then to now, from now to the future, from the future to you know, spaceships traveling around through Mars, can't be done. So um, as a little semi-technical digression, let me kind of tell you why. Imagine somebody did write this program. Um, then they come up to you and say, look at me, I'm awesome. Sean, that idiot, you know, doesn't know what he's talking about. I proved him wrong. Here's my program. I wrote, and I see, I'll see if you ever stop Verifier. The job of this program is to look at some other program it's going to check and see whether that program ever, ever stops. Okay? So you load it with a file, you see if that program ever stops, and it tells you, yes, it'll stop, it'll stop, and it'll tell you, no, it won't stop, it'll run forever, if it'll run forever. Um, I don't care how it works, what I'm going to do is basically say, whoever told you they have this program is either lying or wrong, um, by being a big jerk and creating my evil program. <laughs> my evil program is going to be called evil.exe. <laughs> <laughs> my evil program, the first thing it does is ask that verifier that you say exists, that you just handed to me, and I'm going to say, hey, Mr. Verifier, you said you could tell if any program out in the entire universe whether that program would stop or not. How about evil.exe? Is that program going to stop or not? And so the verifier has two choices. The verifier can say, yeah, it'll stop eventually, in which case I'm going to write evil.exe in such a way that when it comes back and says yes, I'm going to have basically a loop that says, you're wrong, you're wrong, ha ha, ha ha, you're wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> so if it says you're going to stop, I'm going to write the program in such a way that it uses the information from the verifier to make it wrong. Similarly, if it comes back and says, no, you'll run forever, what I'll do is say, thanks for the information, I'm done. Stop. So basically what I'm doing is I'm writing a program that makes the verifier be wrong no matter what it tells me. And since I wrote this program in five minutes, the verifier can't even work on this thing. It probably can't, it certainly can't exist on whole lots of stuff, okay? And the basic problem is anybody that writes this kind of verifier that wants to know whether a program's gonna stop or not stop needs to be able to predict the future, and we're not good at that. Um, so no matter what the verifier says, I can make it incorrect. Since this will work with any verifier program, I didn't depend on how it worked. I didn't care about how long it took. This thing could've took five minutes, it could've taken five years. I didn't care about what kind of computer you ran it on. You can do whatever you want. I just care whether you told me yes or no. Okay? Then any verifier program is going to have this problem. That any verifier program will not be able to tell whether my evil program will run forever or not because I'm a big jerk who made it a liar. Um, so these undecidable problems come up in a lot, a lot of places. There's, it's not just whether your, your machine's hanging or not. Um, it's usually undecidable to create a program that will tell you anything about another program. And these things come up in a lot of security-related situations. So for example, wouldn't it be nice if someone would write a program to tell you if that awesome game you just downloaded from noreallyitsnotavirus.com is going to crash your hard drive? Wouldn't it be nice if somebody said, bing, don't do that. That's going to kill you. <laughs> Sorry, that's undecidable. Same kind of thing. Um, wouldn't it be nice if someone read a program that would tell you if your computer is currently running a Trojan horse that would make you post the I'm a little teapot song on your Facebook wall next Friday night? Or send an email to your significant other saying how much you think they look fat? Or send your uh, personal information to Nigerian finance ministers? Or anything like that? Can we search your hard drive and see if any of that stuff will happen just by looking at the computer? No, that's undecidable. Wouldn't it be nice if someone would write a program to tell you if your bank is running a program that would accidentally erase your account the next time you do a deposit? Sorry, we had a computer glitch. Or you can replace bank running your program that will accidentally erase your account with NORAD running a program that will accidentally launch nuclear missiles. Can we look at a program and see whether that'll happen or not? Sorry, that's undecidable. Wouldn't it be nice if someone write a program that would tell you if any program out there ever in the whole universe does what it says it does? Some program that says, hey, you promised you'd solve this problem. You promised you'd take these inputs and turn it into these outputs. Do you do what you say you do, or do you have bugs? Sorry, that's undecidable. Bummer. Um, <laughs> lots and lots of things that are really, would be really nice to have are really undecidable. So when I say undecidable, remember that means nobody can write these programs. It's not that we're a bunch of lazy, stupid idiots over in the computer science department. Nobody can do it now or in the future. Um, the problem isn't how slow, relatively speaking, computers are versus what they're going to be. The problem isn't how much memory we have now versus how much memory we're going to have later. 
Um, we're not waiting for new technologies. We're not waiting for new kinds of computers. If you've ever heard of quantum computers, um, which people were trying to make exist, and that's a whole other rant. Um, <laughs> Quantum computers, if and when they come, will be very good at making slow things fast. They're not going to be able to make impossible things possible. Um, so we're screwed, you ask me? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really. <laughs> we can prove these things mathematically, and these, these are kind of mathematical facts the same way the Pythagorean theorem is a mathematical fact. Really? Well, um, there's a couple of things that I'm kind of hiding from you. This, so here's the definition of undecidability again. It's impossible for anyone to write a program that will correctly say yes all the times it's supposed to say yes, and no all the times it's supposed to say no. Here's what I really should be saying. Say yes all the time, it's supposed to say yes with 100% accuracy. And say no all the times it's supposed to say no with 100% accuracy. Um, the way I've said these things were undecidable and didn't exist by, was by creating one program where it didn't work on. Theoretically, it's not true, but theoretically, that could be the only program in the entire universe that would screw that verifier up, right? Um, but it is true that what we're really talking about here is 100% correctness, and if you can get to 99.99% correctness, undecidability has nothing to say about that. Undecidability is really a binary proposition. Either you're really always right or you're sometimes wrong, and as far as we're concerned, sometimes wrong is just as bad whether you're almost always right or almost always wrong. Um, it's theoretically possible, but hard, to create a program that's correct most of the time, for some definition of most. Um, the rest of the time, it'll either be wrong or say, eh. um, So, but in a security situation, when you're writing virus checkers, when you're writing a secure system, when you want to make sure nobody hacks into NORAD and launches your nuclear missiles, that does create an exploitable hole. So, um, I don't know how to measure 99.99% accuracy because I don't know what that means relative to people trying to create programs to attack you or anything like that. So we can talk about being able to solve most of the problems and it's better than nothing, but anytime you have a known flaw in your system, you have a known hole for people to come through your system. Um, so the other thing I, I'm kind of hiding here, here's the definition again. It's impossible for anyone to write a program that will correctly say yes all the time I'm supposed to say yes and no all the time I'm supposed to say no. Um, what I should be saying is on all possible input programs. It's another variant of the 100% accuracy. Um, what I'm trying to say here is it's possible but hard to write a program that specially checks certain kinds of programs. Um, you actually do see this in the real world for real safety critical things, medical software, things that fly planes and rocket ships and things like that. Um, for, it's easier if you restrict the kinds of commands the program can do. It's pretty easy to verify your program won't erase your hard drive if you look at every single instruction in the entire program and none of them ever touch your disk, that kind of stuff. So if we kind of cripple the operations, we can say if no dangerous operations happen, then no dangerous, no dangerous operations can happen and you're safe, that kind of thing. But um, it's theoretically possible but even harder to design a different special purpose checker for each program you're worried about. And this is kind of where we're at now in um, verification stuff. We kind of hack up a special case verification program on each thing we want to check and we have to kind of cripple down each thing we want to check so that the kind of undecidable parts aren't in there. Um, but if we do this, keep doing this over and over and over again, that's a lot of programs. There's lots of programs out there now. There's lots of programs being written in the future. Um, having to write a special purpose verifier for every single one of them is a lot of verifiers, and then you get into trouble with who verifies the verifier, and you go down that rabbit hole, and all kinds of stuff like that. And there'll still exist some programs that you can't be checked. I don't think you can even define a special purpose verifier for my evil program, because what's it gonna do, right? It's gonna say yes or say no, and I'm gonna make it wrong. So there's certain programs that can't be verified no matter what. So you can do the special purpose thing for some programs, hopefully the ones that matter, but not for it, but you can't even special purpose every possible problem. So here I am, Captain Bringdown, to kind of give you guys the message, which is there are some problems that can't be solved. This is, I guess I'd call it the speed of light for computer science. You can't fly faster than the speed of light. You can't solve certain kinds of problems in computer science. Um, not now, not ever. 
There's no such thing as 100% security, especially 100% automated security. Anybody who says they have a perfect secure system, you should start thinking about the Titanic <laughs> and how we didn't need to put lifeboats on the unsinkable ship. There's no such thing as an unsinkable ship. There's no such thing as a totally secure system. Um, software bugs are a fact of life, and they're not going away. And it's not that we're bad people, or not just that we're bad people. Um, they are, we can't fix them. We, we can do our best to try to get rid of them. We can do our best to minimize them, but they're always going to be there, and there's no way to automatically remove them all. And as a computer person, I'm here to say sorry. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are we doing any questions or what? I don't know. You tell me if we got time. If, if people have questions, I'll, I'll answer them. If people are just amazed by my awesome rhetoric, then. <laughs> it's, it's related to that, yeah. When you make this talk, right? Um, it's based on that, but it's a separate thing. So, so. Yes, and we, I mean I can get into that kind of argument. There's a one of the problems is there's a there's a countable number of programs and an uncountable number of problems, and that's that's part of why there's going to be undecidable things. Yeah. So this is related to Girdle's incompleteness stuff, which says there's mathematical facts you can never prove that are still true. Um, so that that that's also that's the math version of this talk. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, to what degree do like copyrights on code for popular programs um, inhibit the development of verifiers for those programs? Well, um, there's, there's, there's so many things I want to say about this. Um, what I would say is this: for me to, even for me to be able to attempt to write a verifier for a program, I have to do one of two things. I have to either have access to the program in an environment in which I can run it a ton of times, kind of on all possible config configurations, which, you know, all possible is a large number. Or you have to hand me the actual source code for me to look at. So I'm not sure if it's a copyright thing or, a, or an intellectual property thing or a I don't want word of the holes in my system to get out to the world thing. Apple has some things like that. I don't know, this might be before you guys' time, but there was somebody broke the iPhone and then Apple sued them because they broke copyright on it to, to show what all the, you know, all the ways to you know, exploit the bugs are and things like that. So yeah, that, that is an issue and that is a problem. And so um, there's practical reasons why writing verifiers are hard. There's, there's, there's business reasons why writing verifiers are hard. But there's also theoretical computer science reasons that even in a perfect for some definition of perfect world, we still are going to have problems. So, so yes, that's, I guess, step zero before my step one is can we get access to this thing? Yeah. Um, you brought up Apple, uh -huh. and uh, I've, I've heard, and whether this is true or not, I've just heard it, that like they have competitions to see if people can crack the Apple code or something. Is that just be in like that they're pretty bug free? Is that just because they keep their code very secretive and there's not people who can find loopholes in it because it's so secretive? Or is it their code is so well written that it's hard to find loopholes and almost impossible to find those kind of entr entrance ways? My honest opinion is there are less viruses and things for Apple because less people use Apple. And so there's less people out there. If, if, if I'm, if I'm the 12 year old kid in my garage wanting to take down things. I want to take down the thing everybody's using and specifically take down the thing that more, a larger percentage of people using it are uneducated people who don't have a good virus checker. And so your grandma is probably running Windows. You know what I mean? And so I don't think that Apple is inherently more or less secure. I think the flaws in Microsoft are more publicized because they're bigger and more popular and therefore get more attention from people trying to break it. But that's just my opinion. Anything else? We good?
Okay, we're gonna have a 10 minute intermission before the last two talks, so if you guys wanna walk around or buy some refreshments from Horizon International, feel free. We will be showing another video from the TED website. Um, the, v, uh, the talk is titled, How Common Threats Can Make a Common Political Ground by Jonathan Hitt. So if you've been following the news, you've heard that there's a pack of giant asteroids headed for the United States, all scheduled to strike within the next 50 years. Now, I don't mean actual asteroids made of rock and metal. That actually wouldn't be such a problem, because if we were really all going to die, we would put aside our differences, we'd spend whatever it took, and we'd find a way to deflect them. I'm talking instead about threats that are headed our way, but they're wrapped in a special energy field that polarizes us and therefore paralyzes us. Last March, I went to the TED conference, and I saw Jim Hansen speak, the NASA scientist who first raised the alarm about global warming in the 1980s. And it seems that the predictions he made back then are coming true. This is uh, where we're headed in terms of global temperature rises. And if we keep on going the way we're going, we get uh, a four or five degree centigrade temperature rise by the end of the century. Hansen says we can expect about a five meter rise in sea levels. This is what a five meter rise in sea levels would look like. Low-lying cities all around the world will disappear within the lifetime of children born today. Hansen closed his talk by saying, imagine a giant asteroid on a collision course with Earth. That is the equivalent of what we face now. Yet we dither, taking no action to deflect the asteroid, even though the longer we wait, the more difficult and expensive it becomes. Of course, the left wants to take action, but the right denies that there's any problem. All right, so I go back from TED, um, and then the following week, I'm invited to a dinner party in Washington, DC, where I know that I'll uh, be meeting a number of conservative intellectuals, including Yuval Levin. And to prepare for the meeting, I read this article by Levin in National Affairs called Beyond the Welfare State. Levin writes that all over the world, nations are coming to terms with the fact that the social democratic welfare state is turning out to be untenable and unaffordable dependent upon dubious economics and the demographic model of a bygone era. All right, now, this might not sound as scary as an asteroid, but look at these graphs that Levin showed. This graph shows the national debt as a percentage of America's GDP. And as you see, if you go all the way back to the founding, uh, we borrowed a lot of money to fight the Revolutionary War. Wars are expensive. But then we pay it off, pay it off, pay it off, and then, oh, what's this? The Civil War, even more expensive. Borrow a lot of money pay it off, pay it off, pay it off, get down to near zero, and bang, World War I. Once again, the same process repeats. Now, then we get the Great Depression and World War II. We rise to an astronomical level, around 118% of GDP. Uh, really unsustainable, really, uh, uh, really dangerous. But we pay it off, pay it off, pay it off, and then what's this? Why has it been rising since the 70s? It's partly due to tax cuts that were unfunded, but it's due primarily to the rise of entitlement spending, especially Medicare. We're approaching the levels of indebtedness we had at World War II, and the baby boomers haven't even retired yet. And when they do, this is what will happen. This is data from the Congressional Budget Office showing its most realistic forecast of what would happen if current situations and expectations and trends are extended. All right, now, what you might notice is that these two graphs are actually identical not in terms of the x and y axes or in terms of the data they present, but in terms of their moral and political implications, they say the same thing. Let me translate for you. We are doomed unless we start acting now. What's wrong with you people on the other side and the other party? Can't you see reality? If you, if you won't help, then get the hell out of the way. We can deflect both of these asteroids. These problems are both technically solvable. Our problem and our tragedy is that in these hyperpartisan times, the mere fact that one side says, look, there's an asteroid, means that the other side's going to say, huh, what? No, I'm not even, even going to look up. No. To understand why this is happening to us and what we can do about it, we need to learn more about moral psychology. So I'm a social psychologist, and I study morality. And one of the most important principles of morality is that morality binds and blinds. It binds us into teams that circle around sacred values but thereby makes us go blind to objective reality. 
think of it like this. Large-scale cooperation is extremely rare on this planet. There are only a few species that can do it. Uh, that's a beehive, that's a termite mound, a giant termite mound. And when you find this in other animals, it's always the same story. They're always all siblings who are children of a single queen, so they're all in the same boat. They rise or fall, they live or die as one. There's only one species on the planet that can do this without kinship, and that, of course, is us. This is a reconstruction of ancient Babylon, and this is Tenochtitlan. Now, how did we do this? How do we go from being hunter-gatherers 10,000 years ago to building these gigantic cities in just a few thousand years? It's miraculous. And part of the explanation is this ability to circle around sacred values. As you see, temples and gods play a big role in all ancient civilizations. This is an image of Muslims circling the Kaaba in Mecca. It's a sacred rock. And when people circle something together, they unite, they can trust each other, they become one. It's as though you're moving an electrical wire through a magnetic field and it generates current. When people circle together, they generate a current. We love to circle around things. We circle around flags, and then we can trust each other. We can fight as a team, as a unit. But even as morality binds people together into a unit, into a team, the circling blinds them. It causes them to distort reality. We begin separating everything into good versus evil. Now that process feels great. It feels really satisfying, but it is a gross distortion of reality. You can see the moral electromagnet operating in the US Congress. This is a graph that shows the degree to which voting in Congress falls strictly along the left-right axis, so that if you know how liberal or conservative someone is, you know exactly how they voted on all the major issues. And what you can see is that uh, in the decades after the Civil War, Congress was extraordinarily polarized, as you would expect, about as high as can be. Uh, but then after World War I, things drop, and we get this historically low level of polarization. This was a golden age of bipartisanship, at least in terms of the party's ability to work together and solve grand national problems. But in the 1980s and 90s, the electromagnet turns back on. Polarization rises. It used to be that conservatives and moderates and liberals could all work together in Congress. They could rearrange themselves, form bipartisan committees. Uh, but as the moral electromagnet got cranked up, <clears throat> the force field increased, Democrats and Republicans were pulled apart. It became much harder for them to socialize, much harder for them to cooperate. Retiring members nowadays say that it's become like gang warfare. Did anybody notice that in two of the three debates, Obama wore a blue tie and Romney wore a red tie. <laughs> do you know why they do this? It's so that the Bloods and the Crips will know which, which <laughs> side to vote for. The polarization is strongest among our political elites. Nobody doubts that this is happening in Washington. But for a while, there was some doubt as to whether it was happening among the people. Well, in the last 12 years, it's become much more apparent that it is. So look at this data. This is from the American National Election Survey. And what they do on that survey is they ask what's called a feeling thermometer rating. So how warm or cold do you feel about you know, Native Americans or the military or you know, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, all sorts of groups in American life? The blue line shows how warmly Democrats feel about Democrats, and they like them. You know, ratings in the 70s on a 100-point scale. Republicans like Republicans. That's not a surprise. But when you look at cross-party ratings, you find, well, that it's lower but actually, when I first saw this data, I was surprised. That's actually not so bad. If you go back to the Carter and even Reagan administrations, they were rating the other party 43, 45. It's not terrible. It drifts downwards very slightly. But now look what happens under George W. Bush and Obama. It plummets. Something is going on here. The moral electromagnet is turning back on. And nowadays, just very recently, Democrats really dislike Republicans. Republicans really dislike Democrats. We're changing. It's as though the moral electromagnet is affecting us, too. It's like put out in the two oceans, and it's pulling the whole country apart, pulling left and right into their own territories, like the Bloods and the Crips. Now, there are many reasons why this is happening to us, and many of them we cannot reverse. We will never again have a political class that was forged by the experience of fighting together in World War II against a common enemy. We will never again have just three television networks, all of which are relatively uh, uh, centrist. And we will never again have a large group of conservative Southern Democrats and liberal Northern Republicans 
making it easy, making there be a lot of overlap for bipartisan cooperation. So for a lot of reasons, those decades after the Second World War were an historically anomalous time. We will never get back to those low levels of polarization, I believe. But there's a lot that we can do. There are dozens and dozens of reforms we can do that will make things better. Because a lot of our dysfunction can be traced directly to things that Congress did to itself in the 1990s that created a much more polarized and dysfunctional uh, institution. These changes are detailed in many books. Uh, these are two that I, that I strongly recommend. And they list a whole bunch of reforms. I'm just going to group them into three broad classes here. So if you think about this as a, uh, the problem of a dysfunctional, hyperpolarized institution, well, the first step is do what you can so that fewer hyperpartisans get elected in the first place. And when you have closed party primaries and only the most committed Republicans and Democrats are voting, you're nominating and selecting the most extreme hyperpartisans. So open primaries would make that problem much, much less severe. But the problem isn't primarily that we're electing bad people to Congress. From my experience and from what I've heard from, from congressional insiders, most of the people going to Congress are good, hardworking, intelligent people who really want to solve problems. But once they get there, they find that they are forced to play a game that rewards hyperpartisanship and that punishes independent thinking. If you step out of line, you get punished. Uh, so there are a lot of reforms we could do that will counteract this. For example, the Citizens United ruling is a disaster because it means there's like a money gun aimed at your head. And if you step out of line, if you try to reach across the aisle, there's a ton of money waiting to be given to your opponent to make everybody think that you are a terrible person through negative advertising. But the third class of reforms is that we've got to change the nature of social relationships in Congress. The politicians I've met are generally very extroverted, friendly, very socially skillful people. And that's the nature of politics. You've got to make relationships, make deals. You've got to cajole, please, flatter. You've got to use your personal skills. And that's the way politics has always worked. But beginning in the 1990s, first the House of Representatives changed its legislative calendar so that all business is basically done in the middle of the week. Nowadays, congressmen fly in on Tuesday morning. They do battle for two days, and they fly home Thursday afternoon. They don't move their families to the district. They don't meet each other's spouses or children. There's no more relationship there. And trying to run Congress without human relationships is like trying to run a car without motor oil. Should we be surprised when the whole thing freezes up and, and, and descends into uh, paralysis and polarization? A simple change to the legislative calendar, such as having business stretch out for three weeks, and then they get a week off to go home, that would change the fundamental relationships in Congress. So there's a lot we can do, but who's going to push them to do it? There are a number of groups that are working on this. No Labels and Common Cause, I think, have very good ideas for changes we need to do to make our democracy more responsive and our Congress more effective. But I'd like to supplement their work with a little psychological trick. And the trick is this. Nothing pulls people together like a common threat or a common attack, especially an attack from a foreign enemy. Unless, of course, that threat hits on our polarized psychology, in which case, as I said before, it can actually pull us apart. Sometimes a single threat can polarize us, as we saw. But what if the situation we face is not a single threat, but is actually more like this, where there's just so much stuff coming in, that's like, just start shooting. Come on, everybody, we got to just work together. Just start shooting. Because actually, we do face this situation. This is where we are as a country. So here's another asteroid. We've all seen versions of this graph, right? Which shows the changes in wealth since 1979. And as you can see, almost all the gains in wealth have gone to the top 20% and especially the top 1%. Rising inequality like this is associated with so many problems for a democracy. Especially, it destroys our ability to trust each other, to feel that we're all in the same boat. Because it's obvious we're not. Some of us are sitting there safe and sound in gigantic private yachts. Other people are clinging to a piece of driftwood. We're not all in the same boat. And that means nobody's willing to sacrifice for the common good. The left has been screaming about this asteroid for 30 years now. And the right says, huh, what? No, no problem, no problem. Now, why is that happening to us? Why is the inequality rising? Well, one of the largest causes after globalization is actually this fourth asteroid, rising non-marital births. This graph shows the steady rise of out-of-wedlock births since the 1960s. Most Hispanic and black children are now born to unmarried mothers. Whites are headed that way, too. Within a decade or two, 
most American children will be born into homes with no father. This means that there's much less money coming into the house, but it's not just money. It's also stability and versus chaos. As I know from working with street children in Brazil, mom's boyfriend is often a really, really dangerous person for kids. Um, now, the right has been screaming about this asteroid since the 1960s, and the left has been saying, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Uh, the left has been very reluctant to say that marriage is actually good for women and for children. Now, let me be clear. I'm not blaming the women here. I'm actually more critical of the men who won't take responsibility for their own children and of an economic system that makes it difficult for many men to earn enough money to support those children. But even if you blame nobody, it still is a national problem. And one side has been more concerned about it than the other. The New York Times finally noticed this asteroid with a front page story last July um, showing how the decline of marriage contributes to inequality. We are becoming a nation of just two classes. When Americans go to college and marry each other, they have very low divorce rates. They earn a lot of money. They invest that money in their kids. Some of them become tiger mothers. The kids rise to their full potential. And the kids go on to become the top two lines in this graph. And then there's everybody else. The children who don't benefit from a stable marriage, who don't have as much invested in them, who don't grow up in as stable an environment, and who go on to become the bottom three lines in that graph. So once again, we see that these two graphs are actually saying the same thing as before. We've got a problem. We've got to start working on this. We've got to do something. And what's wrong with you people that you don't see my threat? But if everybody could just take off their partisan blinders, we'd see that these two problems actually are best addressed together. Because if you really care about income inequality, you might want to talk to some evangelical Christian groups that are working on ways to promote marriage. But then you're going to run smack into the problem that women don't generally want to marry someone uh, who doesn't have a job. So if you really care about strengthening families, you might want to talk to some liberal groups who are working on promoting uh, educational equality, who are working on raising the minimum wage, who are working on finding ways to stop so many men from being sucked into the criminal justice system and taken out of the marriage market uh, for their whole lives. So to conclude, there are at least four asteroids headed our way. How many of you can see all four? Please raise your hand right now if you're willing to admit that all four of these are national problems. Please raise your hands. OK, almost all of you. Well, congratulations. You guys are the inaugural members of the Asteroids Club, uh, which is a club for all Americans uh, who are willing to admit that the other side actually might have a point. In the Asteroids Club, we don't start by looking for common ground. Common ground is often very hard to find. No, we start by looking for common threats because common threats make common ground. Now, am I being naive? Is it naive to think that people could ever lay down their swords and left and right could actually work together? I don't think so. Because it happens not all that often. But there are a variety of examples that point the way. This is something we can do. Because Americans on both sides care about the decline in civility. And they formed dozens of organizations at the national level, such as this one, down to many local organizations, such as To the Village Square in Tallahassee, Florida, which tries to bring state leaders together to help facilitate that sort of, uh, that sort of working together human relationships that's necessary to solve Florida's problems. Americans on both sides care about global poverty and AIDS. And on so many humanitarian issues, liberals and evangelicals are actually natural allies. And at times, they really have worked together to solve these problems. And most surprisingly to me, they sometimes can even see eye to eye on criminal justice. For example, the incarceration rate, the prison population in this country, has quadrupled since 1980. Now, this is a social disaster. And liberals are very concerned about this. The Southern Poverty Law Center is often fighting the prison industrial complex, fighting to prevent a system that's just sucking in more and more poor young men. But are conservatives happy about this? Well, Grover Norquist isn't, because this system costs an unbelievable amount of money. And so because the prison industrial complex is bankrupting our states and corroding our souls, Groups of fiscal conservatives and Christian conservatives have come together to form a group called Right on Crime. And at times, they have worked with the Southern Poverty Law Center to oppose the building of new prisons and to work for reforms that will make the justice system more efficient and more humane. 
So this is possible. We can do it. Let us therefore go to battle stations, not to fight each other, but to begin deflecting these incoming asteroids. And let our first mission be to press Congress to reform itself before it's too late for our nation. Thank you. Owu Jr. Gus Woods Wood is a perform, uh, performance poet from Atlanta. He has been, uh, he's been to the National Poetry Slam twice as a competitor for the Art Amok Slam team and competed at the Southern Fried Poetry Slam with the team Voices. He was placed in the 2010 Southwest Shootout, uh, shootout Individual Poetry Slam, the Slam Idol Online Poetry Competition, and in the 2011 Individual World Poetry Slam Haiku Head to Head. He also recently won the Columbus Haiku Competition. Um, his work has been featured in some, of, uh, in, in some Weird Sin Literary Magazine and the Borderline Poetry Journal, for which he has received a uh, Pushcart Prize nomination. He has, he has performed at the Atlanta Queer Literary Festival and the Atlanta-based poetry show We Wish You Were Here and at the poetry venues throughout uh, Atlanta and Ohio. Um, he likes manatees and smokes a pipe. <laughs> um, let's welcome Gus Woods for Falling Up. Poised on the edge, parachute snug in his backpack, fear is a whisper, piggybacking the whip wind, dueling feebly with this crowd chorus in his head calling, jump, jump, jump. He has done enough dumb things and amazing feats to shatter his face into lesser fractals of stardom. He's strangely all right with this. He knows his limits like anyone daring enough to push them this far and besides. He's got a family and friends who want to see him in more than the latest YouTube clip. This stunt, this jump, this suicidal joke can't be anything but perfect, but right. There's always a risk. Of course, it's part of why he does this. Fighting and flying and lighting himself on fire for money and a bizarre sense of incestuous fame with all this etching scars into the inside of his spacesuit. He checks his equipment, curses the height again, takes another deep breath, and leaps. When they asked me to do this talk, I was initially concerned. As a poet, I don't know too much about science, I'm more of a writing kind of guy. And then I realized that the poetic aspect, as the first speaker was talking about, the poetic aspect allows us to examine life in a more interesting sort of lens. It helps us to reveal the heart behind some of these issues. On October 12, 2012, Felix Baumgartner wrote a helium balloon to the stratosphere and jumped off. This jump, the Red Bull Stratus Project, allowed him to break three world records and the sound barrier, using only his body, a parachute, and Red Bull's money. <laughs> Red Bull filmed everything, and I watched it. For the record, everyone in my family, with the exception of my mother, is terrified of heights, of high places, of all the big and scary that's up there. So in between gasps of my own anxiety, I watched slack-jawed as this man, this Crazy Australian jumped off the edge of the world. So, Felix Baumgartner broke three, sound, broke three world records and the sound barrier, but if you ask me, he jumped in the wrong direction. Riding that helium balloon, he could have gone further. He could have allowed space to embrace him like a prodigal son, like he was born there. We're all born there. If you think about it, Earth, planets, are the most primitive spaceships we've got. 
Every one of us here is an astronaut writing this 1.23 times 10 to the 25th power pound spaceship. That's pretty cool. I'm just saying. And so, now, to me, the environmentalist makes sense. If you have a car, you might want to take care of it. Get the oil changed every now and then. It makes sense. Each one of us is a crew member. Each one of us has a job to do. This is not a novel idea. In fact, I learned it from a very unlikely, incredibly nerdy place. It's a small moment locked surreptitiously into the business of Star Wars, Episode 5, Empire Strikes Back. It's a scene on Vader's Star Destroyer. It's a small conference of bounty hunters. When I was little, my most prized possession was a blue and tattered copy of Star Wars, The Essential Guide to Characters. And I read frenzied holes and the innumerable stains of a child's messy eating into this book. Each one of these bounty hunters, with their moments of screen time, had a whole page and a half of information. For reference, Darth Vader, arguably the most powerful and most important character in Star Wars, had only three pages. That's a lot of detail for having nothing to say. Each one of these bounty hunters had their own stories, their own spaceships, their own home worlds, hover packs, motives, weapons. Each one of them had so much detail. There was Bosk, the lizard man. His species is Trandoshan. It's a slaving society. It's a very rough trade. He was one of the only people on the ship more interested in Chewbacca than Han Solo. The Wookiee was like his Django, and he was going to be darned if he let anyone get away without him. Then there was Zuckus of the Respirator, nicknamed the Uncanny One amongst his own people. Could track you from anywhere to anywhere else, made a name for himself on his swamp world with the help of a gas grenade and some friends. Then there's IG-88. This is a killer robot who accidentally gained sentience and a thirst for blood, murdered every scientist in the room as soon as the switch flipped on. Pretty scary stuff. And then, of course, there's Boba Fett, everyone's first anti-hero and the instigator for every eight-year-old argument I ever had with my friends watching the old VCR. You remember VCRs? Watching the old VCR copy of Star Wars going, no, no, you see? You see that plume of smoke right before the scene cuts away, right before the sand pit closes? That's a jetpack. He made it. Duh. <laughs> Star Wars taught me the importance of everyone in the room. Even the ones who don't speak. Especially the ones who don't speak. Star Wars taught me that everyone here is a bounty hunter. With a wanted poster tacked to the back of our brains, each one of us is sharing our minutes of screen time on this rickety ship. We all have it in us. This Felix Baumgartner backward space jump, each one of us is capable of space travel. You see, gravity is a pair of handcuffs. Inside of all of us, our hearts are Houdinis looking to break free. Just give them enough room, and they'll surprise you. This may confuse a couple people. Vultures are my favorite animal. Not because of how pretty they look, but because of a certain predicament that vultures face. When a vulture is eating roadkill, he will eat more than his own body weight. When he sees a car coming, the vulture has a decision to make. He can stay satisfied and let a Chevrolet kiss him into a new life and a new reality, or he can throw up and fly away. Sometimes we have to lose everything in order to fly. Felix Baumgartner broke the sound barrier in three world records falling from a helium balloon. Unfortunately, in the words of someone very wise and very intelligent, that's not flying. That's falling with style. We're all falling with style, each one of us. We've all tripped and found flight at the end of it. It's always that snap banana peel moment of mistake tripping on absolutely nothing, 
choking on water, forgetting how to breathe, these everyday failures that hurt our hearts the most. This extended warranty life, we are told, will not give out, not for no reason. So we guzzle our gas and move forward, retire tread forward. Too often, we see the future through a sniper scope. It is distant, it is narrow, and death is inevitable. There is an entire world looking to block your crosshairs, looking to budge the velvet rope and mosh pit the moment into mistake. Nothing is certain apart from uncertainty. Unfortunately, you will sometimes trip on the mischief of nothing in particular. Water will go down the wrong tube at the worst moment, I promise you. Embarrassment will follow you like wedding cans tied to a bumper. We are married to our mistakes on some days. So we toss rice and run forward, unhelmeted into the sliding glass doors of the world we know we will crash into. This extended warranty life expires as soon as we fall. When we get back up, all bets are off. When we stumble, we can fall in any direction we want, even upward. Felix Baumgartner broke the sound barrier, falling. Imagine, if you can, what we can accomplish when we remember how to fly. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Gus. Now, our final speaker is Dr. Robert Harmon. He serves as the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, as well as the Travel Learning Program Director here at Ohio Wesleyan. He teaches courses in theoretical physics, as well as theoretical and observational astrophysics. He holds a bachelor's degree in astronomy from Case Western Reserve University and a PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. His research specialty is the study of star spots via inversion of photometric lights. Photometric light curves, I'm not quite sure what that means. His presentation is titled, The End of the World as We Know It, Current Scientific Thinking on the Ultimate Fates of Earth and the Universe. Please give me a hand in welcoming Dr. Robert Harmon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the far distant future, things that won't happen until billions of years from now. I'm going to start by talking about the fate of our own sun, and then I'll talk about the fate of the Milky Way galaxy in which we live. Our sun is one of some hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. And then I'll talk about current scientific thinking on the ultimate fate of the entire universe. So let's go back to near the beginning. After the Big Bang, but before the first generation of stars, all the ordinary matter in the universe, the stuff that makes up atoms, the stuff that makes up you and me, consisted of about three quarters hydrogen by mass, one quarter helium, which was fused in the early minutes of the Big Bang from the hydrogen, and then tiny amounts of lithium, beryllium, and boron. There was no carbon, there was no nitrogen, there was no oxygen, nothing else beyond carbon in the periodic table existed yet. One of the most amazing things that human beings have ever learned about ourselves and our universe is that every atom in our bodies, except for the hydrogen, we don't have helium in our bodies, were formed inside the cores of stars billions of, sorry, yes, billions of years ago at temperatures of millions of degrees. And so that means that we are literally, not figuratively, but literally made of stardust. Now, the sun formed from the collapse of a big cloud of interstellar gas and dust about 4.6 billion years ago. Like the universe as a whole, it was made mostly of hydrogen and helium. And the way that it gets the energy by which it shines, which is true for all ordinary stars, is by fusing hydrogen into helium via thermonuclear fusion in its core. 
only in the core, not in the rest of the star, because only in the core is it hot enough, about 15 million Kelvin, about 28 million Fahrenheit, for fusion to occur. Now, the sun is certainly large. Uh, it's very massive, but not infinitely so. And so that means it doesn't have an infinite supply of hydrogen fuel at its center. Eventually, it's going to run out. Eventually means about 5 billion years from now. And what the sun is going to do when that occurs is pretty remarkable. So here we have a figure from 21st century astronomy. It's the textbook that I'm using for the introductory astronomy course I'm teaching at Ohio Wesleyan this semester. The publisher, W.W. W. Norton and Company, kindly gave me permission to use this in the next figure in my talk here. Uh, I want you to look first up here at the top is a representation of the sun as it is today as a main sequence star. That means it's still fusing hydrogen into helium inside of its core. This is a blown up version of it for clarity. But what I really want you to look at is down here, the big red orange thing there. That's what the sun is going to become after it runs out of hydrogen in its core. It's going to swell up until it's some 50 to 100 times bigger in diameter than it is now. It's going to become some 2,000 times brighter than it is now. It's going to be what astronomers call a red giant star. So that is in its correct relative size to the sun as it is today. It's going to become a monster of sorts. Now, I hope you're wondering, why would running out of fuel make the sun swell up and become a monster like that? Well, it has to do with a balance of opposing forces. So the sun today represents a balance between the inward pull of gravity, trying to crush it under its own weight, and the outward push of, push, uh, push of pressure, which is counterbalancing that. Today, the sun is in a stable equilibrium between the two, and the way that's maintained is via those thermonuclear reactions of hydrogen into helium in its core. That keeps the core hot enough and at high enough pressure to support the weight of the layers above it. But when the sun runs out of fuel in its core, gravity is going to start getting the upper hand over pressure in the core. And so over a period of some 1.3 billion years, the core is going to shrink as a result of that. And that means it's going to be losing gravitational potential energy. But that energy doesn't just disappear from the universe. It gets converted into thermal energy, heat, and radiation. So the core is going to be getting hotter as this continues. And it will heat up the layer of unburned hydrogen, whoops, of unburned hydrogen surrounding the core. And it will continue fusing then hydrogen into helium in a thin shell surrounding the core, but much faster than in the core today because this shell will be at such a much higher temperature than the core is now. And it's the release of all that energy that will cause the sun to shine so much more brightly then, and also to increase the pressure in the sun's outer layers and cause them to swell up like that. Even the cockroaches are not going to survive this. So uh, the sun will be, at this point, at the beginning of the end, but not at the end yet. It still will have some tricks up its sleeve. Uh, eventually, the contraction of the core, which will be inert helium, will make it hot enough, about 100 million Kelvin, to fuse car uh, helium into carbon and oxygen in its core. And so it will then have another source of nuclear energy, uh, helium fusing into carbon and oxygen in the core, hydrogen still fusing into helium surrounding the core, after 100 million years or so, it'll run out of helium fuel, and then the carbon-oxygen core will begin to contract and heat up. Helium fusion will continue in a cell surrounding the core. And then we'll have this. The sun will become a red giant for a second time. This time it will be called an asymptotic giant branch star. And it will be even more impressive than it was as a red giant the first time more than 5,000 times brighter than it is now at its brightest, even bigger than it was at a red giant. But it turns out that the helium burning shell will be unstable. And as a result of that, every few hundred thousand years, it will flare up and release lots and lots of energy. And the effect of that will be to puff the outer layers of the sun into space. And the sun will make one of these. This is what is known as the Ring Nebula in the constellation Lyra. It's a Hubble Space Telescope photograph. So 
this, is a, this was a star similar to the sun. Whoops, that's not the thing I would do. This is, was a star similar to the sun. You can see um, layers of material that were blown off the outer uh, portions of the star that are glowing. The reason they're glowing is because of fluorescence from ultraviolet light being emitted from this thing at the center. This is the burnt out core of the star made of carbon and oxygen fused from helium at a high enough surface temperature it's giving off lots of ultraviolet light causing the material around it to glow. Now that material in about 10,000 years or so, and I blink astronomically speaking, will fuse into the interstellar medium and just disappear and all that's left will be the core at the center. That will be the final remnant of the sun, the burned out carbon oxygen core that was left over after it formed a nebula like this. And that object is what is known as a white dwarf, which is remarkable indeed. If you were to take a teaspoonful of material from its surface, you would discover it's extremely dense because the sun as a white dwarf will have about half its current mass still left over, but it will only be about the size of the Earth. And that means it'll be so dense that a single teaspoonful of material from it would have about the mass of a UPS delivery truck. But because of its small size, all the mass being so concentrated, the gravity at the surface will be so strong that the weight of it, remember there's a difference between mass and weight, the weight is the gravitational force, the weight of that teaspoon would be about half a million UPS trucks worth. So what would it be like to stand on the surface of a white dwarf? Well, it wouldn't really be like anything. If you could get Scotty to beam you to the surface, before your neurons could communicate with one another, you would go and just get squashed flat and vaporized and you just become part of the white dwarf. So it's not like anything to stand on the surface of a white dwarf. Kind of incompatible with human existence. Okay, so that's the fate of the sun. What about of our galaxy? Well, it turns out that the sun's environment in its final years is going to be very different, cosmically speaking, from what it is now. We live in the Milky Way galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy. Because we live inside of it, we can't see what it looks like from the outside, but astronomers can study it in enough detail to, to know that if we saw our own galaxy from the outside, it would look a lot like this one, NGC 6744. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across from one side to the other. So light traveling 670 million miles an hour would take 100,000 years to go from one side of the galaxy to the other. If you represent the distance from the Earth to the Sun as being two millimeters, then to that same scale, our galaxy would be the size of the actual Earth. It's enormous. Now this is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the nearest large spiral galaxy to our own spiral galaxy. It's actually a bit larger than ours, about 150,000 light years across. It's 2.5 million light years away. So the light that was used to make this photograph left the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million years ago before our species had even evolved yet. Something to think about. Anyway, Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy, it turns out, observations show, are falling towards one another because of their mutual gravitational attraction. And in about four billion years, which note is sooner than the five billion years it'll take the sun to start becoming a red giant, the two galaxies are going to approach, collide, and merge with one another and form a different type of galaxy called an elliptical. And here is a video of a supercomputer simulation of that merger. You can see time here in the simulation at lower right, so it certainly speeds up time. Our galaxy does, in fact, rotate about four times every billion years. Now we zoom out, and here we see the Andromeda galaxy and a smaller spiral called the Triangulum that's near Andromeda. And so soon, well, in only a few billion years of simulated time, the two galaxies, the two large galaxies, will approach and begin to collide and merge. No stars will be harmed in this process. They're too far apart. But notice that many stars are carried off into intergalactic space uh, in what are known as tidal streams. And it's entirely possible that the sun will be in one of those tidal streams. 
so that it will spend its final days all alone in intergalactic space. I sort of imagine it whimpering to itself. Or uh, it might remain part of the final elliptical galaxy that forms. But either way, the night sky is going to be very different when the sun is in its final stages than it is today. So what about the universe as a whole? Well, you've probably heard that the universe is expanding because the space between the galaxies is stretching out. That's a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Until the late 1990s, it was expected that the expansion of the universe was slowing down. It was thought that the gravity would be slowing the expansion down, but in 1998, two independent teams of astronomers both announced the same remarkable result. Those teams of astronomers were studying what are called type 1a supernovae. A type 1a supernova is an exploding white dwarf in a binary star system. Now, this is a relatively nearby type 1a supernova in a, another spiral galaxy called NGC 4526. So this is actually in the outer reaches of that galaxy. It's one of my favorite Hubble Space Telescope photographs. Uh, a type 1a supernova becomes 4 billion times brighter than the sun when it blows up. So that means we can see them across cosmic distances to billions of light years. And what these teams of astronomers were doing was studying the brightness of type 1a supernova in very distant galaxies. And what they both discovered was that the supernovae were fainter than they would be if the expansion of the universe had been slowing down. The reason they were fainter is because they were further away than they would be if the expansion of the universe were slowing down. The implication was that instead, the expansion of the universe is speeding up. We say that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Now, we can understand why the, ex the uh, expansion would accelerate, again, in terms of Einstein's theory of general relativity, which predicts that if there's an energy intrinsically associated with empty space, it would act as a sort of negative gravity that would speed up the expansion instead of slow it down. And the name that astronomers have given to this energy is dark energy, both because we can't see it and because we're in the dark as to what it actually is. And since we don't know what it is, we don't know exactly what it's going to do in the future, but there are three possibilities which can be considered. So one possibility is that the dark energy is what we call a cosmological constant. Or in other words, the amount of dark energy per cubic meter stays constant as the universe expands. In that case, the universe's scale would continue to increase exponentially. Eventually, every galaxy outside our own would be moving away from us faster than the speed of light. What? I thought relativity said you can't have things move faster than the speed of light. Well, the, the speed of light is a speed limit on how fast things can travel through space, not on how fast things can move further apart because of the expansion of the space in between them. So eventually, our galaxy would be isolated from every other galaxy in the universe. Uh, and then when all the stars have burned themselves out and all the black holes have evaporated, then the universe just becomes cold and dark and empty and more empty over time. Uh, and that's called the big freeze. Now, another possibility would be that the amount of dark energy per unit volume decreases over time. Maybe even it eventually becomes negative. And negative dark energy would act like positive gravity. It would slow down the expansion. So you could get a situation where the expansion of the universe eventually halts and then reverses direction so that the scale of the universe starts to diminish. And in a sort of reverse of the Big Bang, everything falls back together. And we have what we call the Big Crunch. And then finally, what if the dark energy increases with time? The amount per cubic meter keeps going up. Then you would get what we call a uh, uh, hyper-exponential uh, expansion of the universe. And in a finite amount of time, then the scale of the universe would become infinite. And just before the end, everything would get ripped apart, even atoms, even protons, and neutrons. And because everything would get ripped apart, that's called the big rip. Now, I can't resist the temptation to point out 
that uh, if you saw uh, Sean McCulloch's excellent talk earlier, you'll know why I say this. At, in, in any of these scenarios, at this point, all computer programs would cease to run. So in that sense, it's decidable. They're all going to stop running eventually. <laughs> ha, evil program. OK. <laughs> but in any case, uh, none of these scenarios is particularly rosy in terms of the continued existence of intelligent life. But the way I look at it is this. It's billions of years from now, for one thing. So you know, don't lose any sleep over it. And another thing is, I think that what it should do is make us appreciate even more the beauty and the majesty and the fireworks of the era of the universe in which we do find ourselves living. Thank you. Do we want to do a Q&A or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, uh, he's noticing that there's deceleration before acceleration, and why is that? And the answer is that um, there are different components to the universe that contribute to its overall energy density. And in relativity, any kind of energy density counts in terms of gravity. So there's radiation, there's ordinary matter, there's what is known as dark matter, which actually is more abundant than ordinary matter, so it's kind of odd that we call the less abundant material ordinary matter. Uh, and then there would be the dark energy. All the other forms of energy besides dark energy were uh, more concentrated when the universe was smaller. They had higher densities when the universe was smaller. Whereas, as far as we know, at this point, we think the dark energy may be more like a cosmological constant. Its density doesn't change. So very early, if you imagine running time backwards and shrinking the universe to smaller sizes, at early times, matter and radiation were more concentrated than dark energy and would have therefore had a bigger influence. So in the early eras of the universe, uh, positive gravity was winning out over the sort of negative gravitational effect of the dark energy. So at the beginning, the expansion of the universe was slowing down. But there came a point at which, because dark energy wasn't diminishing and the other forms were, that it started to dominate. And then we switched from deceleration slowing down to acceleration speeding up. OK, thanks again. And let's have one more round of applause for all of our speakers. And we'd like to give a special thanks to Ted, the music department, Dean of Students, Kimberly Goldsberry, Vice President Craig Ohm, Professor Eric Nesda, uh, Mona Spalsbury, uh, Don Wright, Cole Hatcher, Elaine Chun, WCSA, w, WCSA, Horizons International, and all the other organizations that have expressed uh, support for TEDxOU, and to all of you for making this possible. Um, before you leave, leave, please note that we'll be emailing everyone an event evaluation. Your feedback is valuable, and we'd love to hear your ideas on how we can improve the future of TEDxOU. Um, if you have any questions about the event, oh, so if you have any time, please answer a couple of questions about the event. Um, and look for him as you leave. Thank you all.